Okay. Okay. Any questions on chapter six? So we're going to look at um, chapter seven, basically interactions. The book kind of mixes things together, so they we already talked about that some, and they have some discussion of interaction in chapter six. Chapter seven will be more about uh, interactions, okay. and. <clears throat> Uh, we'll do some things on stat crunch later today as part of this. So actually, if you want to bring up the files we're going to use, we'll see how far we get. Um, I'm going to start with this pigs data. Uh, it'll just be S2 pigs. Um, I We'll probably go back to this frantic figures <coughs> triple, which I monkeyed with a little bit to make the numbers nicer. I got rid of all the fractions. Uh, and then we might do the superheroes and the births data as we're going through things. Okay. <coughs> um, and again, we're basically comparing additive models with interactive models. Okay. So the additive models uh, we're modeling the averages um, or the individual actually measurements as the grand average plus a treatment effect, plus a block effect, plus an error terms. Okay. Um, and the book a lot of times will use this notation and talk about treatment and block effects, even if there's not actual blocking going on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> When we do the interactive models, we'll have the same thing, plus we'll have an interaction term, gamma, plus an error term. And sometimes in this chapter, they may call this just factor A and this factor B, especially when we're not using block design, block experimental design. We're just using two categorical variables. We might not even worry about which variables are experimental, which, which are observational. We've just got two categorical variables. Okay. <coughs> All right, so let's go to the pigs um, data. Okay. All right, and what's happening here is we got 12 little pigs, and we want the pigs to gain weight. And we're going to have two actual treatments here. So both of these are going to be experimental variables. Um, some pigs are going to get a B12, vitamin B12 supplement. Some pigs are not. Some pigs will get antibiotics. Some pigs will not. Okay. <clears throat> um, notice there's four combinations of treatment groups. And we're going to have three um, units uh, for each of those groups. So we are doing what the book calls replication. And we're actually going to have averages 
for each cell now. Unlike the frantic fingers data, where we have one measurement per combination. Okay? So we're doing replication and we're doing balanced design. Okay? So we'll have, we've got three replicates for each combination. Okay. All right, now, in this case, let's first do a, a two-way responses will be weight gain. I'm gonna let my row variable be the B12 and my column variable be the antibiotics. We will plot interactions and display means and we'll fit an additive model first. And I will have StatCrunch do the residuals and the fitted value. So, first just kind of looking at the results table, uh, it looks like the B12 is significant, if we're just using say 5% um, difference, but the antibiotics is not. Okay. Um, also, we'll talk about degrees of freedom as part of this, um, the variables, it's just the number of levels minus one is your degrees of freedom for the levels. I got two levels for antibiotics, I got two levels for the vitamin, two minus one is one, okay? Um, <clears throat> the total is just one less than the total sample size, 12 minus one is 11, and then the errors, the B up for the total minus the BS for the other one. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Okay, um, now let's uh, look at the interactions. <clears throat> okay, so we certainly, the rough interpretation for these is if your plots are parallel, that's indicating no interaction, or if they're close to parallel. Okay. If they're crossing, that is gonna suggest interaction. Um, the book will sometimes point to, are the lines perpendicular? Okay. So they're kind of, I mean, you're, your slopes can vary continuously, right? So they can be exactly parallel, or they can be perpendicular, or they can be somewhere in between, okay? Where you sort of draw the line, how perpendicular do they have to be? How close to parallel do they have to be? They could be crossing and pretty close to parallel, okay? This looks pretty not close to parallel. This would be suggesting interaction. And the same thing here, definitely not parallel, okay? And both plots kind of tell you the same thing in different ways. In this case, in both cases, we got two lines and two values because it's a two by two grid, okay? All right? Um, so it looks like we are gonna have interactions. All right, now, the, um, the book also talks about just looking at the means tables and looking at differences of differences. Okay. Um, and at one point I think they just say interaction is a difference of differences. Okay. 
So what do they mean by that? Um, you could either look at the differences in the row variable values as you go from one column to another. Okay. So the row variable here is B12. So if you're not getting antibiotics, the difference between getting B12 and not be, getting B12 is not very big, only three. Okay, in, what, in the weight gain, that's a measure. If they are getting antibiotics, the difference is really big, 51. Okay, so we have a difference of differences. The differences are not staying the same, they are changing. The interaction plot is, is basically showing you that. That would be the second interaction plot. If you're not getting antibiotics, the differences in weight gain is very close. If you, if you are getting antibiotics, the difference is really big. Okay? This is just a visual representation of that. Um, and typically what will happen is if you have a difference of differences one way, you will the other way. Okay? So we could look at the differences here. Um, the difference between an no antibiotics and antibiotics is 16 if you're not getting B12 and is like 32 if you are getting B12. So we have a big difference of differences telling us there's interaction. Okay. okay. Um, so what else can we say about this? Yeah, so I mean it's saying for the one-way additive model, it doesn't look like antibiotics is making a big difference. Um, 20.5 to 28.5, we have a difference in that variable, you know, the, what we're calling the beta effect is relatively small, eight ounces or whatever pounds of thing. But there's a bigger difference here. Let me zoom in. Okay. Now, about fitting the model. That crunch does do that automatically. Okay. Here are your fitted values. Those should all be computed this way, basically. Okay. Now, we want to keep in mind that the uh, tau is the cell mean minus the grand average. So this would be if I'm thinking of B12 as my tau, I'm taking this minus the grand average to get my tau. Right? And the book is going to start writing this this way. If I'm using I here, they're going to put tau I dot, sort of saying that there's this, the other variable that's sort of representing the J. Okay. But for this, you have tau 1 of 11 and a tau 2 of 38. So you would take each of those minus the grand mean. The betas would go beta dot J. minus the grand mean, and the same for the beta would be the mu dot j minus the mean. Okay. I'm not going to put up all the different formulas that they have, they, these are in the book, but you can think, I've got these um, treatment means, and I've got these block means, if I'm calling that, or factor A means and factor B means. 
And all I'm going to do is take each of those minus that to get my how treatment effect and my block block effect. Okay. Then I just take for my model, I take the grand mean plus the tau treatment effect plus the beta. That's going to give me my fitted value. These three together give me my fitted values. Okay. I made a very ugly table which <coughs> displays this. And the book has some of these too. Okay. But yeah, for each of these, I took the 11, the mean on the side, minus the grand mean, there's my tau, minus 18.5. Okay. Since I only have two factors, and I have a balanced design, these two are just going to be opposites of each other. Okay. If I take the other mean, treatment mean, minus the grand mean, I'm going to get just the same value I got for the first one, but switch the sign. Okay. Same thing for the betas. Taking individual means minus the grand mean, okay? but I'm arranging them according to what treatment combination each of the pigs is getting. Okay? So here I've got all the tau ones here, the tau twos here. Here I've got beta one, beta two, beta one, beta two. Okay? So then the fitted value would be grand mean plus tau plus beta. So, 24 and a half minus plus negative 13 and a half, so that's 11, plus negative 4 is 7. Okay. I take the grand mean plus the tau plus the beta, that gives me the fitted value. And those three are all the same, the fitted value of 7. Here I get a fitted value of 24 and a half, same 13 and a half, but now I'll plus 4. So I'm going to get 15. Okay. Now here I get 24 and a half minus 13 and a half, so that's 11. No, I'm adding. I get 38 <coughs> plus negative 4 is 34. 24 and a half plus 13 is 38 plus 4 is 42. Okay. I get three copies of each fitted value. Okay. If you go back to Stack Crunch. There they are. Your 7, 15, 34, 42. Okay. So those are created using the additive model fitted value formula. All right. Then the residuals are <clears throat> just, these are now going to vary according to individual pigs. You take each individual pig weight gain minus the fitted value to get the residuals. So you can just double check off. If I just take this column minus this column, I'm going to get these columns. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so you can kind of, I don't know how big are those residuals. Some of them are, I mean, they're mostly double digit residuals. Okay. If we wanted to, we could do a, <clears throat> um, let's just do a QQ plot of residuals. Let's see what we get. Yeah, not super great. It's a pretty small sample size. You're getting a, a fair amount of curvature there. I guess we could also look at a histogram Yeah, it does not look very well. So, assessing the model, we would say we're probably not meeting the normality condition. Okay. Now, it's always a caveat when you have a pretty small sample size, it's easier not to have normality than if you have a large sample size in some ways, just because of sampling variability. Okay. Uh, but we're skeptical.
if you had been doing a lot of this research and you had reason to believe that the larger population was normal based on previous samples that were larger, that might ameliorate your, your skepticism here. Okay? If I kind of know that the population of weight gain, even with these various categories, would be normal, then I might say I can rely on that previous data. Um, okay, so that is the additive model. Let's do an interactive model. We have reason to believe there is interaction, so let's do two-way. I'll do weight gain. I'll do the same B12 and the same antibiotics. I will now not check the additive model, but I am going to put in the fitted values and the residuals. So I'm gonna get another pair of columns, but now they're gonna be for this. <clears throat> and I'm gonna do B. Okay, so let's kind of talk through this. Uh, first looking at the results table. The interaction certainly comes out to be highly significant. And notice that taking into account the interactions, the B12 and the antibiotics are now statistically significant. Okay? This could frequently happen when you have interactions that are statistically significant. Okay, okay. a little bit about the degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, the DFs here will be so the DF for factor A will be the same as before. The number of levels minus one. I just got two levels can take that minus one. And the same DF for factor B will be the same thing. Um, and sometimes the book will call this I minus one. And this will be J minus one. They're using index I for the tau's, index J for the betas. They'll just call capital I, capital J the number of levels, okay? I've got two levels for each, okay? All right, and then the DF for the interaction will be I minus one times J minus one. All right, and then the DF for the error residuals okay, will be I times J times K minus one if you have a balanced design. Okay, with K replicates for each cell. In our case, we have k equals three. We have three replicates for each cell. Okay. I is two, j is two, k, k minus one would be two, because times three times two is eight. Okay. So that would be how you do this degrees of freedom. Okay. 
And then what should happen is these will add up to the 11, which is your total minus one. Right? And notice your sample size is going to be i times j times k. 2 times 2 times 3 gives me my 12. I got my 2 times 2, 4 combinations. Each combination has 3 in it. We're going to get 12. When we do unbalanced design, things are going to change. But for balanced design, this is how it's going to work. All right, now, <clears throat> how about the, let's look at the, um, Fitted values. Okay, so I'm gonna go. Yeah, I guess I'll look at the means table. The means table isn't gonna change. Okay. When you go from an additive to an interactive model with how the beta effects, and we're still calling those the main effects, those are not gonna change. You're just now adding an interactive effect, which is measuring in some sense how those are interacting in their effect on the response curve. Okay, so this part's going to be exactly the same. Okay. So how is, what's the gamma going to be? Okay. Well first I'm just going to go here. Here's your fitted values for the interactive model. And here's the residuals. Certainly the residuals look like they are now on average a lot smaller. Okay. Anybody notice anything about the fitted numbers that we're getting? They're bigger. The fitted values are exactly the means in your means table. 19, 3, 22, 54. Okay. They still are replicated three times. Okay. There's still nothing in these that depend on each individual replicate. That's going to be here. But what will happen is for two-way ANOVAs, the gamma IJ will basically take up the error between what's in the means and um, what you get from the additive model. Okay? So basically, the fitted values here are going to exactly fit your means table. That will always happen. We'll do some other examples with much dirtier data than this, and we'll see that. Okay. Well, that's kind of cool. Okay. So do you need to know what this individual thing is to do this? Not necessarily. If you're using StatCrunch, we know what the fitted values are. I guess you could get the gamma by just subtracting these two. The difference between this fitted value and this should be your gamma, okay? Because this part of the fitted model will be the same as it is over here. The only thing you're changing is you're adding this term. So the difference between the two versions of fitted models will be your gamma. Okay? That is gonna change the error you're soaking up some of the error that was in the additive model with this interaction term. So you will, it's kind of like when we did multiple linear regression, you always made your R squared no bigger and usually smaller when you added a variable. We're essentially adding a variable here. We're adding interaction as a variable. So we're gonna reduce our residuals, generally speaking. So that will be a good thing, I should say. The trade-off is you've made the model more complicated now. Okay. So it's kind of
kind of the same thing as before. Okay, but that's kind of cool. These fits are now exactly what's in the mean state. And then the residuals will still be the um, individual things here minus the fit. 30 minus 19 is 11. 8 minus 19 happens to be negative 11. 19 minus 19 is 0. 5 minus 3 is 2. 0 minus 3 is negative 3, etc. So your residuals will just be those differences just like before. Now we could maybe look and see are these residuals any better behaved than the other ones? Let's do the histogram first. And you can always go back and rename these if you want, call it residuals interactive or something. All right, again, it's not a big sample size, but that looks better than the other one. Okay, let's do the QQ plot. Still some curvature, probably better than the last one. Okay. Uh, so that could happen. These are different models, even though they're based on the same data, and the assessment could be different as well. Okay. All right, now if you want to, here is the ugly table for the interactive. Now, the tau's and betas are exactly the same as before. Okay. If you wanted to, uh, another way to calculate the gamma terms okay, would be all right, to take the means from the table minus the tau effect, minus the beta effect, minus the grand mean. So you can check what was the mean exactly what one was. Nineteen. Okay. Nineteen was my first mean. Okay. So if I go nineteen minus negative thirteen point five. Minus four, so I'm at 36.5, minus mu, I get 12. Okay. How often you would actually want to identify the gamma, I don't know. This, you can get the fitted values from the technology, which you'll be able to do with StatCrunch, and you can do it with R2. You might not care. Okay. The main thing is just think. The gamma is soaking up the error that you were getting before between the, the cell means and the means table uh, and your fitted values. Okay. Uh, if you just remember that for two-way ANOVAs, your fitted values are going to be exactly the same as your table means. That's really the point, I think. Okay. Um, now, let's do a couple other examples. Okay. Uh, let's do the frantic fingers triple. <clears throat> All right, so first, let's just do kind of the same thing. Let's first do an ANOVA rate subject drug. I'll first do the additive model. And then let's do the non additive model. Let's just kind of compare side by side. QA. Okay. 
Here, both factors are significant. Um, notice the sum of squares for subject and product are the same in both models. That's not going to change. That's because we're not changing the data and we're not changing the beta and the count. And get the same sum of squares for those. Okay. Um, but the error, you're now going to have an interaction sum of squares and an error sum of squares. Notice those two add up to what was the error sum of squares before. 366 plus 310 is going to equal 676. Okay. <clears throat> Notice the degrees of freedom. Okay. Again, we got four subjects and three drugs, so we get three and two for the DFs there. Okay. The interaction is the three times two. Okay. This should be four times three times um, K minus one. In our case, I tripled this. I got three replicates, so K is three. 4 times 3 times 2 gives me my 24. Okay. And then these will all add up to this. <coughs> 35. Okay. Um, okay. The means tables are going to be the same. But even though we didn't put in the fitted values into the um, into columns, we know the fitted values for the interactive model will be these means. Okay, I will get exactly the 24, the 15, the 27, etc. We'll need to do that in a second. Okay. Um, let's look at the interaction plots. And the interaction plots are going to be the same. For each model. That's not changing. Okay. And these were, I changed the data a little bit um, to make the numbers in the means table nice, but you're getting roughly the same thing we saw last time. Okay. And here there's subjectivity. These look kind of parallel. On the other hand, they do cross. <coughs> and the other one. These cross, and you have some change in slopes. Okay, so there's enough change there that's giving us a statistically significant interaction going on. Okay. All right. Any other observations or so with this one since the interaction. That's a good question. It is a trade-off. Um, the interaction is significant, so there might be some reason to um, use it. I guess if we wanted to, let's just see what the, you have smaller error with the interactive model. So that would be an advantage. Okay. If we want, let's go to refresh. Oops. Let's go to edit. Let's just put in the fitted values. And this is the interactive. And then let's put in the fitted values for the additive.
you know, one thing you could do would be compare how different are the predictions in my gender, okay? So here's the interactive, here's the non-interactive, okay? They are looking pretty close, generally speaking. I guess we could look at the residuals too. The residuals should be smaller because the error sum of squares is smaller from the interactive model. So that would be an advantage. Okay. So I'm not answering your question yes or no. It's kind it, of a sad thing to say. Yep, it's a, it's a trade-off. I'm making the model more complicated by putting the interaction in, but I am getting more accurate predictions from my model. Okay. So is, there <coughs> is there a reason you would do an added model instead? Uh, it's simpler. I mean, in terms of like, because we're not calculating any of this stuff that's already done for us. Right. It's becoming more complicated. It really isn't our problem. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. It would depend a little bit on what use are you going to make of this. Yeah. I mean, we're. Why would we do this particular study? We want to know the effects of the stimulus, okay? In some sense, you wouldn't even have to compute the fitted values at all if you were to do, because that's all you cared about, okay? So if that's all you cared about, you could say, well, I can see in both models, the drug is giving me a statistically significant effect, okay? If I wanted to go back and compare um, the two different stimulants, the caffeine and the theobromine, I could compare those with a two sample t test and see which one is giving me a bigger boost to my, you know. So, yeah, like I say, you could, there's no reason not to use the interactive model. You're going to get the same result, it looks like, either way. Um, let me throw out a term here. Uh, I, the book has used this term. A lot of times we talk about a model being, quote, robust. Okay. What that means is, um, are the results likely to stay stable as I make small changes in the model or if I do the same model with a different set of data. Okay. We could say one advantage to doing both of these analysis would be I'm getting the same result as far as my conclusion about the drugs, whether I use the interactive or the interactive model, or the interactive or the non-interactive model. That's telling me my result about the drugs is quote, robust. It's not likely to change. It doesn't seem to be changing as I change different things about the model. Okay. okay. Now let's do one more. Let's do. Uh, do I do superheroes or births? Do the superheroes. Let's do the superheroes. Okay. <clears throat> so I got a, I got two different response variables, numerical variables. I got a lot of different uh, categorical variables. Anybody have a favorite? Which two categorical variables should we pick? Okay. Um, And I don't know, I think height and weight are fairly well correlated. I'm just gonna pick weight. Okay, so we wanna go publisher. Okay, so there's gonna be two publishers, I think in this data. Okay. What do you wanna use for the other one? And notice it will let you pick the numerical Let's pick 
what the devil? Do what? Alignment. Alignment? Moral alignment. In the battle of the devil. Yeah. Okay. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do the non-interactive model. Oh, but I am, let me do one other thing. I am gonna check fitted values. Okay. <clears throat> and, okay. So both moral alignment and publisher seem to affect the weight. Interaction is also significant. Yeah. Um, we can kind of just look at the weights a little bit if we want to. Yeah, Marvel seems to have heavier superheroes than DC Comics. Okay. Uh, neutral superheroes seem to be the heaviest by a lot. Bad ones are bigger than good ones. You might have three different differences there. Okay, we can do the team test if you want to. Okay. Um, now, let's look at the fitted values. you get here in your fitted values column should be the same as what's in the means table based on which choice of alignment and which publisher you have. Okay? So this 279, that seems to be a Marvel, a bad Marvel superhero. Okay? The 332 is a bad DC superhero. 173.9 is a good DC, and we've got a, bad, a good Marvel. You're going to get those same means just based on the six combinations that you have. <coughs> well, that's kind of cool. And you can check the DFs. There's two publishers. There's three alignments. This times this is this. Okay. Um, Two times three. Okay, for unbalanced designs, these are going to be different. Okay. I believe this is going to be I times J minus one. Two publishers, three alignments is six, minus one gives you the five. Okay. There's also a model now. Where the unbalanced design, they give you a model number. Okay. And then what will happen is the error is going to be the total minus the model. Okay. Which I think is what happened when we did multiple layer graphs. Okay. All right. So next time we will um, talk, a, we'll kind of, kind of revisit the idea of experimental design issues. None of the examples today were block design. They all had replicates in them. And some of them were not even balanced designs. Okay. So we'll, there's some terminology we're gonna use related to experimental design under those types of conditions. All right, sounds good.